Southern California, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Today we have ourselves a kind of busy show today as we're going to try to get through this as quick as possible. That's because your boy has busy things in this world. But let's get on into the Southern California sports today. Lakers got back Anthony Davis, but they lost to the Pelicans last night. It's been that type of season for the Lakers, and it's just been dreadful for them. But the Anaheim Ducks finally, yes, finally snapped their losing streak. Oh my goodness. It only took beating the Arizona Coyotes in order to do so. Thank goodness. But it's kind of too little too late, possibly. And how about the Rams signing Bobby Wagner from the Seahawks? Big, 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 big pickup there. And I missed one of their free agent signings from last week as they traded away Robert Woods. Which made me sad face, but it is what it is. All that and more here on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Darren Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on I Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I appreciate you all tuning in. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try to get through this show as quick as I can, trying to get the major sports teams out of the way, along with getting some previews out of the way for the MLB, and obviously getting the Dumb Dumb, out of the, we- Dumb, Dumb of the Week award out of the way. So... Now that we have the intro out of the way, let's get on into the Southern California sports action. But first and foremost, we have a word from our sponsor. iSports Radio is proud to call the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team the official sponsor of iSports Radio. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to trap for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter, at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram, at Southern California underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing in the word Southern California, then Warriors, in the search bar. Definitely do follow iSports Radio on Twitter and on Instagram at iSports Radio. And by going to the search bar on Facebook, you could type in the word IE, then sports, then radio. And iSports Radio has a website, www.iesportsradio.com. And when you go there, there's a Patreon link with five different tiers, starting off at $5 a month. This donation gets you a shout from all 30 of our shows, and higher tiers include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of IE Sports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on a segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Because for the past seven and a half years, IE Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content, ranging from interviewing legendary athletes to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all, all major sports cities around the country. In addition, IE Sports Radio has been interviewing coaches and other authorized media personnel. All the while, IE Sports Radio has been continued to be by the fans and for the fans. And with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. 
Thank you, everyone, for making and helping and continuing your support of making iSports Radio your direct feed for all the sports. Also, the 2022 NFL Draft is right around the corner, and iSports Radio is excited to announce that its third annual Mock Draft Challenge is going to be forthcoming. The rules are simple. Predict all 32 first-round picks. No trades, no modification, no tricks, no going into the pool after eating an hour before, none of that. The, the participant who has the best mock draft will receive a shout-out from all 30 of our shows and a chance or and their choice of an IE Sports Radio hat or t-shirt. For more information or to submit your mock draft, please reach out to Mike Pat at Let's Wine underscore IESR. His Twitter link will be in the description of this show, so definitely do reach out to Mike Pat. And as always, good luck. And then also, the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournament is winding down, but are you unable to catch any of those games? Then IE Sports Radio, USRN, USRN2, and Wellington Sports Radio have you covered when it comes to all of those broadcasts. It's the... Games are probably going to be broadcasted on USRN and USRN2 since we're winding down the the tournament as the tournament is in the Final Four. Well, in the women's case, it's now in the championship with South Carolina and UConn, but I digress. And then all of those broadcasts will be featured on Mixler.com or the Mixler app. So definitely do check, check them out there. And the iSports Radio Fan of the Month is Marcy Vargas. She is a Packers fan hailing from Mexico. Yes, iSports Radio is global, just like DJ Khaled. (laughs) I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But iSports Radio is all over the world. We're trying to get global. (laughs) So now, without any further ado, let's get on into that Southern California sports action. I'm going to try to go quick as possible, like I said I unfortunately have other duties to attend to, but I got to do this show. So the Lakers are really POing me. The Lakers got back Anthony Davis, which is good. But unfortunately, the Lakers lost to the New Orleans Pelicans. And that loss to the Pelicans sadly could not have come at a worse time just because the Pelicans are also vying for play in uh, playing in play in spot as is, and while the Pelicans have not locked up a play-in spot, the Lakers are falling further and further back of possibly missing the play-in game. They are now one full game back of the San Antonio Spurs, which I'm surprised people had the San Antonio Spurs doing something, considering the Spurs are still trying to get over the loss of Kawhi Leonard. So, for the Lakers, going back to them, they lost to the Pelicans 114-111, and and in addition to that, they lost earlier this week 122 to 109 against the Jazz, and then they lost to the Mavericks 128 to 110, and then they also lost to the New Orleans Pelicans this past Sunday 116 to 108. So the Lakers have had tough sledding; they've lost five in a row, and they only have five games remaining. And the schedule looks so brutal. They've got the Nuggets tomorrow. They've got the Suns Tuesday. They've got the Warriors Thursday, then the Thunder on Friday, and then next Sunday they've got the Nuggets at Denver. It's not looking too promising for the Lakers because four out of those five games that I just mentioned, they're all against playoff teams. And the Thunder have even given the Lakers fits this year. And keep in mind that Anthony Davis just came back, so he's going to need it. His, it's, he's going to need some time to get his sea legs back when it comes to getting back on the floor. He wasn't too bad. I heard that he wasn't going to have a minutes restriction from Frank Vogel as Davis had 23 points and 12 boards and 6 assists, which isn't bad. I mean, the for coming off of not playing in over, what, four months, I want to say? He's He looked rather impressive, and I feel bad for Anthony Davis just because now the entire Laker nation wants him gone. And this is something Marcellus Wiley touched upon on his show. As Lakers fans need to realize, yes, Anthony Davis has been getting injured more times than not. However, 
we also got to realize Anthony Davis did help LeBron and the entire Lakers get a championship. And I do not give a rat's tail if that was a bubble ring. I do not give a flying frick if that is a if that was 2020. It's still a championship. Don't even question me about it. Anyway, back to that. It's not Anthony Davis's fault that he gets injured. Like the poor guy just is in the wrong place at the wrong time when he gets banged up. And also the Lakers gave up so much to bring him in. And that was kind of the goal for the Lakers. They traded their number four pick, I want to say, and Brandon Ingram and a few other a few of their other players for Anthony Davis. Like, they gave up so much for Anthony Davis. So, either they're going to try to have to get the most out of Anthony Davis going forward, or they're just going to have to trade him for, I wouldn't say, like, like a value pack, but still... I, they'd have to. I don't know how much they're gonna get for Anthony Davis in return, but the Lakers still have to roll with Anthony Davis, just like they, how they have to roll with Frank Vogel. Like it's not Frank Vogel's fault that the Lakers were struggling. Like the Lakers have such an old team. They have. I think they have. They have to have one of the oldest, if not the oldest, team in the NBA. Like the experiment clearly did not work, and Russell Westbrook sadly just could not mesh with the Lakers. Like, he's had his moments. Like, he even had a game-tying three. I think it was against the Toronto Raptors, and I think that made all Lakers fans and people that hated him eat their words. So, yeah. It's just been tough sledding for the Lakers, and it only gets tougher from here on out. And judging by how... I don't even know what the Spurs' upcoming schedule is. They have the Trailblazers at home on Sunday. And they've got the Nuggets on Tuesday, Timberwolves on Thursday, Warriors next Saturday, and the Mavericks on Sunday. So the Spurs, I wouldn't say have a tough schedule, but it does feature playoff bound slash possible play in game teams, with the exception of the Timberwolves and maybe the Nuggets. I'm pretty sure the Nuggets are going to be in the top seven. And. I don't know about the Timberwolves. The Timberwolves are so much more improved, though. But still, I think that... I don't, I don't want to say the Spurs have a tough schedule, but I think it's manageable. But their schedule is a much more different schedule just because they have the Trailblazers who have pretty much punted the season without Damian Lillard. And all in all for the Spurs... They could possibly go four out of five with, or I'm sorry, not four out of five, one out of five. But for the Lakers, it seems like every match is a battle when it comes to, uh, when it comes to possibly winning a game, even against some of the worst teams in the NBA, like the Wizards and the Raptors and whatnot. So all the while for the Lakers, it's just not been tough it's been not it's not been easy and i'm just wondering if the lakers should punt the season so we'll see how it goes as we welcome marcus lo great in the chat room he says what up what up what up doe and i'm still in a i still like marcus's comment from last week he says the lakers haven't been all around garbage they've been regular garbage and that's absolutely facts right there so all right before i die from playing from talking about the lakers yes the Lakers have been all around garbage. And yes, Marcus, it's over for the Lakers. Even if they do make the play in game, how far can they really go? As yes, I am grieving, Marcus. I've pretty much punted the Lakers season ever since AD went down. So or after they fell out of the uh I don't, no, actually, no. I, I, after they moved into the number 10 spot. So I've punted the season ever since the Lakers hit the number 10 spot. And, yeah. Jumping on over to another play-in game bound team, the Clippers. They have actually solidified their spot in the play-in game. So they can't finish in the top eight, but they can't finish below the top 10. So, I'm sorry, not the top eight, the top seven. They can't finish at number seven, but they can't fall out of the top ten. So 
The Clippers finally, finally, finally picked up a win. It took them long enough. They beat the Bucks 153 to 119. Now, I know what we're all thinking. Oh my goodness, the Clippers beat a legit team in the Bucks. We should all be afraid of the Clippers, right? No. Both the Clippers and the Bucks rested their starters. I know. I know, Clippers fans, you're probably just unhappy that you heard me saying that. You pro- I probably burst your bubble, but it's, it's a little too good to be true. But Robert Covington had 43 points for the Clippers, which I'll give him a little mini clap right there. So the Clippers kind of needed this win just because they had lost their last seven games – Earlier in the week, they lost to the Chicago Bulls in overtime, 135-130. to They actually were leading for a good portion of that game, and then the fourth quarter happened, and they kind of gassed out. And actually, that's my apologies. Their losing streak actually ended at five games when they defeated the Utah Jazz, 121-115. to Now, I was very surprised at this win, just because the Clippers were down as many as 25, but in typical Clippers fashion... They came back to beat the opposing team. Now, part of the reason why they were able to have success is because they at, they th- saw the return of Paul George, which is huge for them. They're going to need Paul George now more than ever just because we still, still have not seen Kawhi Leonard, and it's looking like he's not going to play this year. I'm not putting any money on Kawhi playing this year. He's still recovering from that ACL injury that he suffered from the playoffs. But Paul George came back. It was a miracle beyond miracles, and every Clippers fan was happy because he put on a show. He had 34 points in his return, and he made six three-pointers, and he shot 50% from the field, which is pretty good if you ask me. So all in all, it was a great homecoming game for Paul George, and it was a great win overall. I kind of forgot that this game was won by the Clippers just because I pretty much was like, oh, Clippers are down big. They're not coming back. And I think I went to bed. I almost, I think I almost went to bed before the Clippers game went off, and then I saw the Clippers win, and I'm like, okay, good for, good for the Clippers. Good job. So... Like I said, Clippers are pretty much a play-in tournament team. They're cur- they are currently eight in the play-in standings. As once again, they can't fall anywhere lower than number ten, but they can't go any higher than se- than than seven. I don't even think they'll get to seven, just because they're still six games back of the Timberwolves as. The Clippers only have four games left. So, yeah, they can't get any higher than eight as is. So they're pretty much locked in at eight. The Timberwolves can still make the playoffs as they're only two games back of the Nuggets. And But for the Timberwolves, they're going to need help from the Lakers and Spurs, which <laughs> if this were the days of old, I think that it would be doable for the Timberwolves. But no, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen. I don't think the Nuggets are going to lose to the Spurs and the Lakers, let alone three times, let alone three times between facing those two teams. So for the Clippers, they close out, they play the Pelicans on Sunday at home, and then they are home Wednesday against the Suns, and they've got the Kings on Saturday, and then they've got the Thunder on Sunday, which to me... I don't really think I should be fully invested into the Clippers just yet, just because they'd have to lose out. I don't even think they could even fall to ninth. Like, the only way that happens is if the Pelicans win out and then the Clippers lose out. And if that were to happen, then the Clippers were would be unable to be the number seven seed. They'd have to be the eight seed at best, so... All in all, for the Clippers, they have, at the very least, they're in the play-in tournament. However, they're not in the big dance. But I could still see the Clippers making the playoffs, as in the top eight. But they'll need, they'll definitely need Paul George to 
come up big once again. But they have other players coming up big. They had Robert Covington, which was pretty nice, and they still have other talented players on their team. It, their matchup against the Bucks doesn't really do them justice, just because, well, they rested a bunch of their players, but if they could get some of their help from their bench, such as Amir Coffey and Luke Kennard and Terrence Mann and Ivaka Zubak, who I still hate that the Lakers traded him to the Clippers, maybe the Clippers can turn some heads, but I'm not putting money on the Clippers to win it all. Last year was kind of a miracle on its own that the Clippers went all the way to the conference finals, but unfortunately the Suns brought every Clippers fan down to reality. So that's going to do it for the NBA portion of the show. Jumping on over to the NCAA women's basketball side of things, we did have one team in from Southern California in the NIT. I know what everyone's thinking. We don't care about the NIT or the WNIT. Well, Guess what? There was still a Southern California team in the WNIT that was still playing, and I still have to make note of them. So that team was UCLA, and they were able to get past their Pac-12 foe, Oregon State, which was really awesome. They, I want to say they beat them on Monday, was it? Or was it la- – it wasn't – No, it was last Sunday. It was March 27th. So this past Sunday, they beat Oregon State, which was really awesome. But on Thursday, the road to the NIT or the WNIT championship ended as UCLA lost to South Dakota State 62 to 59. Considering it was such a tough season for UCLA in the regular season, I want to give them a tip of the cap just because they almost won the WNIT. And once again, UCLA is still kind of that that uh, they're somewhat of a threat. Obviously, they lost so much from last year's team. They lost a lot of players to last year's team, and they had to go through a lot of adversity. But for me, I think UCLA should consider this somewhat of a successful season. Obviously, they lost in the Pac-12 quarterfinals. I want to say to Oregon, but. For me, I think it's still a good season for UCLA regardless of having to play in the WNIT. I mean, the fact that they almost won something is really incredible. And also, we can't hate on the N- the NIT or the CIT. I think, for me, any sort of championship is pretty good. It's just that we just can't make too big of a deal of it. You can't just say, oh, we won an N- the NIT or the CIT and then gloat it to, like, a team who has won, like, a bunch of national championships. So that's just my little take on it. So we'll see. But that is going to finally do it for the NCAA men's and women's basketball side of things from Southern California. So now we must jump on over to some NFL news. So I actually forgot to mention this when it came to the Rams, but the Rams actually traded... Robert Woods, and I that one really kind of hurt me just because he's a former USC guy, and he also played some. He also played football at Sarah High School in Gardena. So, I think all Southern Californians were very, 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 very sad when Robert Woods took his leave, as the Rams traded him to the Titans. For can we get a drum roll? A 2023 6th round pick. Okay. I kind of sadly have to disagree with this trade. I understand that the Rams had to make room for some of their receiver core. But now I have to eat my words for what I said a few weeks. I think it was last week where I said the Rams were having probably the best receiver core in the NFL. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, that I would say their receiver core is bad now, but it kind of just took a little bit of a step back. But unfortunately, they needed to make room for their salary cap and just to get more players. And unfortunately, I guess they just could not take a chance on Robert Woods. So just because he got bet, he got hurt. He tore his, ACL, and he was out the rest of the season. Strangely enough, he was out 
when Odell Beckham Jr. got to the Rams' facility as... It really is a bummer that the Rams only got a sixth round pick. I wish they had gotten like more, but I'm sure he'll do good things for the Tennessee Titans. Marcus says the Rams have a salary cap we have we are all unaware of, and he says get Jerry Jones on the phone. The Rams are cheating. Well, Marcus does make note of that as transitioning into who they got just recently. The Rams managed to sign Bobby Wagner from the Seattle Seahawks, which was big, 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 big. And yes, I understand the the Rams seem to be playing unfair, but they're having to reload. They lost Vaughn Miller to the Buffalo Bills, and now they're going to try to get... They're going to try to, like, pick up the pieces and re-add their their defensive prowess just because they did get word that Aaron Donald is back for next year. And I unfortunately, I want to say it's a five year deal for, yeah, it's a five year, $50 million deal for Bobby Wagner. So do I think the Rams are cheating? Maybe. I mean, they've, they've probably turned off salary cap mode and they're trying to basically, rebuild from last year just because they need to have that stout defense for next season just because I think the NFC might be loading up just because the Bucks brought back Tom Brady the Niners are going to look potent potent as ever the Cardinals are on the rise I don't know about the Packers obviously they lost Devontae Adams but all in all I wouldn't say the NFC as a whole is all great just because the Saints, the Panthers, and the Falcons aren't really that great, and the Seahawks kind of took a step back, and then there are other teams that might have taken a step back, but we'll have to see what come, what happens going forward in the NFL offseason. But getting Bobby Wagner was huge, huge for the Rams, just because that it no longer it means that the Rams no longer have to face Bobby Wagner. And they it boosts their defense. It's a big get for their defense, especially after losing Vaughn Miller. So, and then they also lost Sebastian Joseph Day to the Chargers as well. So, all in all, I think it's a great pickup for the Rams. We'll have to see what other moves the Rams make going forward. Remember, they don't have too much draft capital. I want to say they are without a first and second round pick, so they won't be picking until the third round. So... We'll see what the Rams do. We'll also see what the Chargers have to offer, just because we haven't heard any a whole lot of news from them going forward. Oh, actually, no. There was some news from the Chargers. Kaiser White, sadly, is no longer a Charger, as he signed a one-year deal with the Philadelphia Eagles. And that was kind of a big loss for the Chargers at the linebacker position. I thought Kaiser White was very, very underrated. And I guess there were rumblings on... Kaiser White not being happy or something happening at his camp that kind of made Kaiser White from last year want to walk out the door this year. So kind of a big blow for the Chargers defense, but that's why you have the draft and that's why you have the remainder of the NFL offseason. I'm not going to get too worried about the Rams or the Chargers until maybe training camp happens or maybe the NFL preseason. So... Still plenty of offseason left, and if you're a Rams or Chargers fan and you're still sad about some, certain players leaving, there's still plenty of offseason left. I just want the Chargers to get rid of Chris Harris Jr. Please, please get rid of Chris Harris Jr. This man should not be on the Chargers anymore. If he if he gets re-signed by the Chargers, I'm done. I, I, I can't, I don't want to see him anymore. Like, I just don't... He's cooked. He got gassed. He went He went as a double agent for the Chargers in that final game against the Raiders. Please, just don't bring back Chris Harris Jr. At the very... But also, when it comes to the Chargers, they have the... I want to say they're still top 10 in salary cap space. Not entirely sure about that, but... The Chargers are still top 10 in salary cap space. I don't know their exact number, but 
they still have plenty of more signing space for their roster. But they also got to be aware of of Justin Herbert's rookie contract. I think he has two more years left on his rookie contract, and then the Chargers have to either pick up on his fifth option or they have to franchise tag him, but I'm pretty sure they want him locked up for the future. So we'll see. So that's going to do it for the brief NFL news. I guess to make note of some college football, USC is going to be having their combine, or not their combine, their spring football games. Once again, it's just spring football. It's nothing to get... I mean, if you want to watch it, then go right ahead. And But I'm not really too much into spring football until we get to see a team versus another team in pads, full 11-on-11 contact. I'm not too invested in college offseason. Unless it's, of course, it's transfer news, it's injury news, it's coaching news, or it's just big-time news. So that's that for college football, the very, very brief college football that I probably talked 30 seconds about, but I digress. So jumping on over to the NHL, the Anaheim Ducks finally won a game. It took them 11 matches to finally lock up a win. But they beat the Arizona Coyotes 5 to nothing on the road. Good job, Ducks. You beat one of the worst teams in the NHL. And now you are still not having a good season. The, the losing streak that the Ducks had was a 10-game losing streak. And it got to the point that they were near the bottom of the Pacific Division. It almost got to the point that they were near Seattle's range. Oh, actually, Seattle hat was still Seattle's still in like the forty point range. The Ducks are still in like the were still in like the mid sixties before last night's win. The Ducks currently have sixty eight points and they made progress. They surpassed the San Jose Sharks. They're still twelve games back of the Vegas Golden Knights. So let's not hold our breaths on the Anaheim Ducks possibly turning it around. Just because we are in the last month of hockey of the NHL season and that there's still a walloping twelve games remaining, and the only way the Ducks make the playoffs playoffs is if they win out and then the Vegas Knights forget how to play hockey, as well as the Vancouver Canucks as well. So, and looking at the Ducks' schedule, they have the Calgary Flames, which is going to be tough. The Panthers and the Lightning, also going to be tough. The Kings twice. The Blues. And heck, even the Dallas Stars might give them some trouble. So, the Ducks really wet the bed on this one. And, yeah, I'm saying wet the bed just because, once again, they had potential this year. But, unfortunately, signing old guys basically pulling the Lakers, and then just wasting away Gibby's career did not help. At the same time, at least the the Ducks have some key pieces they could be very, 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 very happy about, such as Trevor Zegras, as he scored a lacrosse-style goal. Now, as a lacrosse junkie, well, not junkie, but a lacrosse fan of my own, Lacrosse goals in hockey are very, very tricky, especially on ice skates. Lacrosse goals in general are also tricky as well. So the fact that Trevor Zegras has been such a bright spot for the Ducks means that there's some hope for the Ducks at the end of the tunnel. But it's not going to be for this year. Next year, maybe. And it's a good and it's a good thing that the Ducks won last night just because last week I said if the Ducks still have their losing streak – by the time I go live this week, I would have ripped them a new one. So you all get the you all get the exemption of me not ripping the ducks a new one. <sighs> now let's jump on over to the LA Kings, which are still chilling out in second place as they begin the month of April and their final twelve games of the season tonight against the Winnipeg Jets. They have a big game coming up against the Calgary Flames on Monday, which could, hence the word, could be crucial for the Pacific Division crown, just because the Kings are five points back of Calgary, and if, for some reason, the Kings get hot and the Flames 
whittle out or wither away. The Kings could possibly take that Pacific Division crown. That's if the Kings get hot. The Kings have kind of been an off and on team as they just recently beat the Calgary Flames in a shootout 3-2, to two, which is good. It's progress. Though Calgary did win a point, it still is nice to beat the big brother of your division. But it was kind of tough sledding prior to that just because the Kings lost to the Edmonton Oilers in a shootout 4-3, to three, and then they got drubbed by the Seattle Kraken 6-1, to one, which, ugh. Losing to that team is not going to do you any favors, Kings. I'm just saying. And then the Oilers. I can understand losing to the Oilers just because they're fighting for their playoff lives too. However, you can't afford to lose to teams like that as well. So all in all, for the Kings, they have 12 games remaining to try to basically become – to try to, first of all, solidify their playoff spot. And then second of all, try to knock off Big Brother Calgary. Because they're only four points ahead of the of Vegas. While I do think the Kings will make the playoffs, they just can't get too complacent. But they're not the Anaheim Ducks. The Kings should be able to lock up a playoff spot sooner rather than later. Like the only way that they don't make the playoffs is if the Kings go cold, the Canucks get hot, and then Edmonton and Vancouver move ahead of the Kings in the Pacific Division standing. So. That's my little spiel on the LA Kings. It's great to see the LA Kings are starting to become more competitive, and it's great to see them actually winning games, and it's great to see a Southern California team winning games. I wish we could have two teams winning, but unfortunately the Ducks didn't want to do themselves any favors, but I digress on that. But the Kings, I am happy for, even though I'm more so of a Ducks fan, I could be happy for the Kings as well just because... They're Southern California, and they're kind of the heartbeat of Hockey Town in Los Angeles. Yes, I know the Ducks won their first Stanley Cup sooner than the Kings, but the Kings have two Stanley Cups. Ducks only have one. Case closed. (laughs) Sorry to all the Ducks fans, but I needed to lay the wood down. But that is going to do it for the NHL portion of the show. Let's take ourselves a commercial breaky break. When we come back, we shall have some MLS talk, and we shall have ourselves a little bit of a preview on the MLB MLB season. And also, we have the Dumb Dumb of the Week Award. Who will it be this week? You'll have to find out when we come back. You are listening to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Shy town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox. We'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi-Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Ladies and gentlemen, 
My name is Davidson. It's your boy, Latarius Lock. And we are the hosts of Fast Break here on IE Sports Radio, where we discuss everything in the world of basketball from prep to the pros. You guys definitely check us out, man. Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We got all the basketball information you guys need. So we look forward to you guys listening in. And please do, because we are the best basketball show on this side of the Mississippi. And please do check us out on Twitter at Fastbreak ISR. D Lock, where's our time again? 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That gives you guys plenty of time on a Sunday. Tune in. Sports Radio. It is your direct feed for all that is sports. It is Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris every Tuesday night right here on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris is the most comprehensive view on Philadelphia sports exclusively right here on IE Sports Radio. You know what it is. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Tuesday night, IE Sports Radio, Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris. Back with segment number two of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed. For all that is sports, you can check out all of those amazing amazing shows right here on IE Sports Radio. Definitely check out Philly Sports Talk, Fast Break, and Chi Town Weekly as Kale Henderson pops in. The, Kale Henderson pops in the chat room. He says Rams are signing for Super Bowl wins. A rebuild is worth it after a couple Super Bowl wins. Yeah, the Rams are signing for Super Bowl wins because that's the main goal. You want to win Super Bowls. And the Rams now have expectations going forward. So, jumping on over to the MLS, and I, I feel bad for Kale because he kind of missed the MLB portion, of, or not MLB, NFL portion of the show. I feel horrible that he missed it just because I talked a little about the Rams and how they traded Robert Woods, but... They got Bobby Wagner in return, so I think it was worth trading Robert Woods, in my opinion. So, jumping on over to the MLS. So, LAFC is still undefeated early on in this season, as they defeated the Vancouver Whitecaps 3-1, to which is nice, because they're still atop the Western Conference, which is great and all. They, they still have the same number of points for with, as Real Salt Lake. As LAFC kicks off the month of April with a with an away game against LAFC, or Orlando LAFC plays Orlando as Orlando City just came off of a win over the LA Galaxy and they just tied Portland one to one. So for LAFC, <laughs> it's all good, Kale. I understand you're at work. I appreciate you tuning in and you being at work and. I tip my hat to you just because I know that feeling, but you didn't miss too much. I just talked about the Rams getting that, so getting Bobby Wagner and whatnot, so you didn't miss overly too much, but it is what it is. So back to LAFC, and welcome Gina G. I appreciate you tuning in. Yes, I'm having a great show, but back to LAFC and Orlando. This is kind of going to be one of those interesting matches just because 
Orlando, they're doing pretty good so far. They're through five matches. They have two wins, two draws, and one loss. So I think facing those East Coast teams or Easter Conference teams are going to be quite the fascinating matchup just to feel out your opponent. And we'll see if LAFC can continue their hot streak. Well, I wouldn't say hot streak, but their early winning ways, just because we have lots of season to go through. As LAFC, in LAFC's win over Vancouver, they got two goals from Ryan Hollingshed. And despite falling behind 1 0 early in the match, LAFC came back. They got this equalizer from Hollingshed, the lead goal from Carlos Vela. And then Hollingshed added the insurance goal to give LAFC the 3 1 lead and win over Vancouver. So. For LAFC, it's looking promising for them, and we'll see if they can continue their winning ways. As, once again, tonight they have Orlando. Next Saturday is going to be fun because LAFC heads down to Dignity Health Sports Park to play their neighborhood rival, the LA Galaxy, who, like I said, are coming off of a loss to Orlando at home. So, tough go for... The Galaxy, who play Portland tonight, or no, they play tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. So, for me, this is kind of going to be another big test for the Galaxy. The Galaxy had early success winning against New York NYCFC, and then they had success winning at Charlotte, but they just lost, but they lost to the Seattle, Seattle Sounders, and then they lost to Orlando. So, after two wins and two losses, it's not. It's obviously, er, it's still early for the Galaxy. A win over Portland would be great for the Galaxy's confidence, as going into that rivalry match against LAFC, the Galaxy are going to need as much confidence as they can, just because LAFC is playing really good. And then after their matchup against the Galaxy. They play Chicago, then they're back home against Nashville, then they're on the road against Salt Lake, which is going to be another big test. Gina says, you probably already discussed the Lakers, but I just want to say I hope LeBron does win the scoring title so that the season doesn't go all for naught. Hey, I, I'm all for that, Gina, and it, the Lakers have got to have something, Laker fans have got to have something to be somewhat happy about. I mean, you gotta look at. I gotta look at the glass half full. Obviously, this season was a wash for the Lakers, but I do hope LeBron does win that scoring title. And yeah, the the fact that he's been averaging thirty a game despite being what in his late thirties, like thirty seven, it's quite amazing, honestly. So I do hope LeBron wins that scoring title as well. But back to the Galaxy. I'm hoping the Galaxy can turn around before they play LAFC in El Trafico. That would be quite interesting to see if the Galaxy can overtake LAFC, but it's early. As Kale says, soccer players are a list method acting psychopaths. Homie's so crazy sometimes. So homie's so crazy committed to their roles. They sprint like 10 miles a game. Can't trust them. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not, I am not the best when it comes to talking soccer. I try to get into it. I've seen a couple of games, but I've, j- I've covered a couple soccer games back in my days at junior college as well. But for me, I, I'm not the biggest soccer fan, but I do. I am a Galaxy fan. I hope to be more of a avid fan. I don't want to be like an average Joe fan. I want to get more into this, into the soccer portion of things. So, and then Kale makes a Will Smith joke about the uh, about the Will S- Smith slap. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they need to get some sense knocked into them. Yeah, I I agree, Kale. So, jumping on over to the MLB. So the MLB. Oh, Gina says she loves the Galaxy versus Quakes rivalry. Yeah, I like the, that rivalry too. I mean, I'm more so of the of El Trafico just because it's LAFC versus LA Galaxy, and we like and Galaxy Twitter is so funny, and especially against LAFC. 
It's it's really funny just because LAFC has not won anything while the Galaxy have at least won two MLS Cups. And yes, Gina, SoCal versus NorCal is always, always a rivalry. Facts. Facts right there. So jumping on over to the MLB. So next week is opening day, which is awesome. And I'm happy the MLB finally got a deal done. So... I'm going to gauge on how each team will do just because I don't really care for, like, spring training games. I know you could call me a Grinch and say, oh, my God, Taryn is being a party pooper about spring training. Well, again, when it comes to, like, preseason games, it's not really my cup of tea just because I don't want to overreact or underreact. I just will say, okay, cool, this is – it's it's a preseason game. They won a preseason game, or they lost a preseason game. All that matters to me is the health of the players and the development of certain players. So, the Angels will have the honor of taking on the reigning AL, AL West champions, the Houston Astros, I mean Astros, on Thursday, going all the way to Sunday, which... Ugh... That's going to be very – that's going to be a really tough season opener for the Angels. Like, facing the Astros at home, I understand the Astros are good, but it's just going to be such tough sledding to start off. They do get a little – they do get a little bit of a breather when they face the Marlins, but the Texas Rangers are going to be – are also going to be tough. And then they got the Astros at Houston later on in the month. So I wouldn't call it a brutal start to the season, but it's going to be a little bit of a tough four game stretch, but we'll see what happens when they play Miami. And Larry B says, what the heck episode 83 time flies. Yeah, it does. Time time does fly. And if you're astounded by episode 83 of SoCal Supreme Sports Show, just wait till you see Set Point, which is at episode 136 coming up on Monday. As Adam says, Angels and Cubs are going on right now in spring training. Yes, but I'm not going to get fully invested into that game. You can't draw me into that game. I will not pl- tr- get suckered into spring training results. You cannot trick me. I am above spring training and preseason results. I will not get tricked. <laughs> but uh, for this four-game series, I hate to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I think the Angels only take one game over the Astros. It's not that I don't think the Angels can have a great season. Obviously they can because they spent all their picks from last year, all 20 of their picks on pitching, which was their major issue. But it seems like they always get get off to an interesting start, and then they go down, and then they start losing game game after game after game after game after series after game after series, and then eventually it gets to the point where the Angels miss the playoffs, and then I'm sad-faced because I feel bad for Mike Trout. But no, Marcus, you're not tricking me. I will not get suckered into preseason and Spring training games. <laughs> uh, I, I love you guys in the chat room. Thank you for telling me that, Adam. And he says the Angels are winning the spring training game against the Cubbies 2-0. Thanks, Adam. Okay, but overall for the Angels, I think... I want to say they could finish second in the AL West. I think my ex, my reality for them is third place... But my floor for them is fourth place. So my hope for the Angels is they finish second. My reality is third. And then my floor is fourth for the Angels. I feel the Angels have potential, but it seems like things always get in the way for them. Either themselves are getting in the way or other things are getting in the way for the Angels. So that's my little take on the Angels for this season. Like I said, I think they have that potential, but they always seem to trip over themselves. And not that this really matters, because it seems like now Adam and Marcus are suckering me into spring training, but 
surprisingly, the Angels have the best league, the best record in the Cactus League, which means nothing because it's spring training. Yeah, I said it. And then the Dodgers have the second worst record from the Cactus League. Just thought I'd throw that out there. So speaking of the Dodgers, Gina just mentioned that the Dodgers and Giants are going on right now in spring training. So for the Dodgers this year, I think it's self-explanatory. The Dodgers, well, for stars, the Dodgers have a three-game series against the Colorado Rockies at Colorado on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Winning at Colorado is always so tough, and I would not be surprised to see the Dodgers only taking one out of three. Like, I think my expectation for this series is the Dodgers will take at least two out of three. If they get three out of three, awesome, but I think two out of three is kind of your happy face for the Dodgers. Yes, the Dodgers got off to a blistering start last season with their first loss coming against the Oakland A's in extra innings, but for me, I think their first loss... Yeah, good job, Adam and Marcus. (laughs) They're high-fiving one another in the chat. But for me, I think the Dodgers take two out of three against the Rockies. My overall expectations for the Dodgers is simple. I think they finish atop the NL West. I feel they can, and my my hope for them is that they can, and my reality for them is that they can, but my floor for them is probably second place in the NL West. Like, obviously the Giants are still talented as ever, and then we still don't know if the Padres can actually get their act together despite Fernando Tatis missing the first few months. But f- I want to say it's like three or four months that he's missing. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll see. But for for the Dodgers, it's either their NL West champs or they're going to have to go on a longer path to the playoffs through the wild card round, which can basically be the one and done situation if you don't play your cards right. For the Dodgers, I think they have a lot of of expectations and I still frown upon what Dave Roberts said about they're going to win the World Series. A lot of things could happen this season. So if Dave Roberts isn't careful by the time the MLB season ends, he could be dumb dumb of the week or possibly dumb dumb of the year. So we'll see. That that's just fuel for the fire right there. So I think for the Dodgers, it's simple. Their expectations are high. They know what they must do, and if they want to be contenders, they're going to have to basically win the games they're supposed to win. And against these tough, against these big time opponents, such as, I want to say the Brewers are up there, and then they also have the Giants in their rivalry game, and then they've got the Padres and all those other big time teams from the National League. I think. The, Do- the Dodgers have to basically show up. And I think their pitching is what's going to make or break them. The Dodgers just recently made a trade, and I'm going to have to go back to this trade, but they just made a trade to the Chicago White Sox, which I think is kind of beneficial to both teams, I want to say, as they traded A.J. Pollock for Craig Kimbrell, which Kimbrell is a good re- good relief pitcher from what I've heard, and I guess Pollock what just wasn't cutting it. But I wish Pollock the best, just because he had his moments with the Dodgers. I just think getting Craig Kimbrell is going to benefit their pitching, just because their pitching is either hit or miss. It's either they're going to have good pitching or they're going to have really bad pitching. And if they have bad pitching, then it, it, it's not going to look good for them going into the standings. Just because, remember, last year they they finished one game back of the Giants and eventually it wound up costing them a possible better chance at the playoff, or better playoff run, even though they did wind up beating the Giants in the in their series, but I digress on that, so... Adam says Dodgers White Sox would be a trendy World Series pick. I would actually like that. It would be rather different. 
And it would be fun to see the White Sox actually do good and actually make the World Series. We'll see. And then on to the Padres. The Padres are kind of the toughest one to really predict. Like, the Padres, now, obviously they missed the playoffs last year, and it got to the point where everything was looking good for the Padres, and then injuries kept kept piling up, and then losses eventually kept piling up, and they just went down the toilet. And sadly, they just missed the playoffs, and it sucks for the for the Padres. But I think there's still hope for them. Obviously, Fernando Tatis Jr. being out doesn't make matters better, but there's still there there is hope for them. As the Padres start off the season with a four-game series at Arizona, so at the Arizona Diamondbacks, so obviously the standard choice would be Padres sweep this series. I think the Padres take three out of four. Now, obviously, Padres fans are probably saying, what are you saying? Of course the Padres are going to sweep the Diamondbacks. Well, it's the first game of the series, and you never know what these first game series is. Like, everyone's going to be coming in fresh off of, fresh off of spring training, even though it kind of got forced upon us just because the MLB just couldn't get a proper deal in time but for the first series it's going to be feeling out your opponent and feeling out where you're at in terms of being high or being low I think the Padres could start off high just because after their series because after their series against the Diamondbacks they have the Giants and then they have the Braves and then they have the Reds which is obviously going to be tough sledding but if they can get three out of four they could build off that. If they get two out of four, then I guess that can be considered a success. Zero through one wins against the Diamondbacks, and then it's it's obviously evident that the Padres will be missing Fernando Tatis Jr. Because he is out for the first three to four months, and if if the Padres could have a 500 or better record when Tatis comes back, then that's a feather in their cap. But they can't really hold their breath for too long just because, once again, it's going to be tough sledding without Tatis. Especially when you have those teams that I just mentioned. And then you also have the Dodgers on the schedule. And they don't really get a bit of a breather until they face the Pirates in the latter part of the month of April. So my overall expectations for the Padres is this. They're kind of a wild card. I feel they're so tough to predict just because they could either go the boom route where they could, hence the word could, be right there with the Dodgers, or they can go bust where they wind up missing the playoffs or just barely missing the playoffs. I think for the Padres, I think they have that potential. I just think they're kind of – I have a little bit of an undecided on on – on my reality for them. My my ceiling my my ceiling for them is basically and my hope for them is they're right there with the Dodgers if not they could somewhat surpass them. My floor for the Padres would be this. Would probably be third place. Third place right below the Giants and hoping to scrap their way into the playoffs just because they were right there when it came to getting a wild card spot. Unfortunately for them, they just kind of fell off, and the Cincinnati Reds kind of swooped in and took it. So I think for the Padres, it's all about attrition and consistency, and if if they can keep themselves together and not have too many problems going forward. As Adam says, the Kimbrel Pollock trade was a huge win-win. Sox needed a right fielder, and the Dodgers needed a closer. That's facts right there. As both teams benefited from that trade, some are saying the Dodgers benefited more, but then some are saying that the White Sox benefited more. I'm just going to say it was just great a great trade for both sides. Let's just leave it at that. Let's all not argue about it. Let's not have arm wrestling contests. None of that. So that is pretty much going to do it for the MLB portion of the show. Before we sign off... And before I head off to my busy day, 
or busy night soon to be, we got to give out the Dumb Dumb of the Week Award. So the Dumb Dumb of the Week Award can go to anybody. It could go to myself. It could go to my neighbor's dog or cat. It could go to anyone that gave me a hard time or just anyone that did or said something stupid. So I actually have too many Dumb Dumb of the Week Award awards to give out. So the first one, I hate to give this award out, and this is no offense to him. This is probably the mini, mini Dumb Dumb of the Week award that I give out. It goes out to Marcellus Wiley. So I love Marcellus Wiley. I love me Marcellus Wiley. I loved him back when he was with the Chargers. I love his personality. I really want to meet him in person one day. <laughs> but the dude said something really some, – he said something that kind of – I wouldn't say ticked me off, but he ticked off a lot of Lakers fans. He said – He's like he was happy that the Clippers won the same night the Lakers lost, and he said there are two different teams in L.A. Mention he referencing the fact that the Lakers weren't in the play playing tournament at the moment, while the Clippers had pretty much solidified their spot in the playing tournament. Now, obviously, he makes a good point about that, but he obviously needs to realize Clippers and Lakers have kind of, in terms of championships. It's kind of gone mostly to the Lakers. I know the Lakers had some of their championships coming from Minneapolis, but the Clippers just recently made the Western Conference Finals. You can't just say that there are two different teams in L.A. Obviously, the Lakers are going the other direction, while the Clippers are somewhat going the right direction. But in terms of overall, it's still it's still Lakers over Clippers. I know the Clippers swept the season series against the Lakers, but he's got, my boy Marcellus has got to realize until the Clippers get a championship, Los Angeles is still a Laker town in terms of basketball. But I'm not going to, but I'm not going to bash him overly. That's why he gets the mini mini dumb dumb of the week award. He gets the smallest dumb dumb of the week award. Now, the other the other mini Dumb Dumb of the Week award, I kind of have to give out to a team. It's not a professional team, but it's something a team did that kind of dug their own grave in terms of winning and losing a game. So, I know high schoolers can be funny at some times. I know people who run Instagram accounts can be funny, but... This happened to a local high school girls lacrosse team that I covered. So this happened to Newport Harbor girls lacrosse, a team that I absolutely have supported since 2012. And they're really awesome. And the players are are always nice. They greet me and the coaches are always awesome. But what they did was kind of dumb. They had their annual rivalry game against Corona Del Mar. They have one of two games, considering it's also a league game. But something they posted on Instagram kind of fueled the fire for Corona Del Mar, the rival school. So what Newport Harbor did was they posted on their Instagram account. They said, bow down to your queens. And it was a picture in the background of two of their players hovering above Corona Del Mar's team that was in a picture. Now, obviously, I get it. Everyone wants to have fun and and, like, make jokes and of everything. However, in a rivalry game, that's just fuel for the fire. That's bulletin board material. You never, ever, 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 ever should do that before a rivalry game. It just does not work, and as a result, Corona Del Mar beat Newport Harbor 12-11, to which actually marked the first time in six tries that Corona Del Mar beat Newport Harbor in girls lacrosse. So, the moral of the story... Don't give your opponent bulletin board material. It will never work. It always comes back to haunt you. The old saying goes, if you talk smack, you're going to get whacked. And that's the clean version. The dirty version is obviously talk, spit, get hit. Unfortunately, I don't have the explicit tag, so I can't use the actual word, but I digress. So that's the other mini Dum Dum of the Week award in the books. So now we go to the main Dum Dum of the Week award. So obviously when it comes to making a t- the playoffs or making a tournament, it's always great for that. However, 
Team USA's men's soccer team did the dumbest thing ever. They made a banner for making the the World Cup. Now, obviously, that's that's not bad. Now, obviously, they made a banner saying, we made the World Cup. However, Team USA's men's soccer team made the banner, but they had not qualified. Let me say that again. Team USA's men's soccer team made the banner saying that they qualified, but they hadn't officially qualified. (sighs) What have I told everybody about assuming? If you assume things... I promise you, you will be on Dum Dum of the Week Award for this segment. I love the U.S. men's national team. I'm glad they made the World Cup draw. But doing that is a big bruh moment. It's like, why are you doing that? I I have no words. (laughs) First of all, why are we doing banners in the first place? It's almost as bad as when USC's men's basketball team got rings for making the Elite Eight from their athletic director. But that was from... That's in the past. I don't understand why we're making banners just because you qualified for the World Cup. I get it. It's a major accomplishment. It's a major load off your shoulders. But at least make the banner when you 100% qualify. I just can't do it. I just can't do this anymore. Like... Why are people thinking that it was – why are people thinking that they have something down pat when it's not official? Now, I get it. Team USA's men's soccer team needed to not lose by six goals to qualify. But it still can happen. Anything is possible in this world. Ugh. I just can't, man. Like, everyone who keeps assuming is absolutely – going to drive me bat crazy. Whether it's sport teams, whether it's players, whether it's reporters, whether it's me, anything of that sort, you just can't assume. It's gonna, You're going to be on Dumb Dumb of the Week, and I'm going to make sure of it. So to the U.S. men's national team who made the banner of saying that they qualified when they hadn't officially qualified, you are this week's Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipient. So dumb. You are really dumb. For real. (laughs) (laughs) And that, my friends, is all she wrote. We gotta stop with the assumptions, people. Actually make things and when things are official. Adam says... It's almost as bad as the Nashville Predators raising a banner for making the playoffs. That's even worse. Or it's even as worse as when the Colts raised a champion a banner for making the AFC championship that one year when they got decimated by Brady. <laughs> and Gina loves the Kawhi laugh. And I guess I can use this word on the air, but Gina says she makes an assume joke. It says, you make an ass out of you and me. That's basically assume. So that's a good one, Gina. And I still can't believe the U.S. men's national team did that. Uh, I thought we were supposed to be professional people. But I digress. And this, and that right there is also bulletin board material. And that is also... Basically, things that that basically motivates everyone because it makes people say they qualified for the tournament and made a banner. That's cute. Uh, on that note, before I lose my mind, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time to get on out of here because I got to head out of my house in about 20 or so minutes. Yeah, dig. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I appreciate everybody that tuned in. Big shout out to the chat room. Big shout out to Marcus Lewis Gray, Gina G, Adam Carnick, Larry B, and Kale Henderson for stopping by. And also, big shout out to our new Buffalo host. 
Patty back who he was listening in. So I appreciate you all tuning in and listening. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at any point at any time of the day, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I also definitely appreciate you as well. For everyone here at iSports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. You all have yourselves a great rest of the weekend. Don't do anything dumb that's going to put you on Dumb Dumb of the Week award. I really, really will not hold back. And you all have yourselves a great weekend. I'll be at Long Beach State tweeting out the Long Beach State Hawaii and volleyball match. I'll see you Monday for set points. You all have yourselves a great weekend. And remember, SoCal is for SoCal. Peace!